My name is John Passfield, and the title of this reading will be John and Mother Goose, video 25, Story Towers. That's story hyphen towers. So here is my novella, John and Mother Goose, The Carnival of Tales, a picture of John and Mother Goose, surrounded by nursery rhyme characters at the Mother Goose Carnival of Tales. While driving his granddaughter home from daycare, John suddenly finds himself standing in the midway of a carnival of Mother Goose fairy tales. He's greeted by Jack of Jack and Jill fame, who tells John that Mother Goose is expecting him as she has a role for him to play. But what does Mother Goose want? Why does she think John is a writer of detective stories? And why, when she meets John, does she greet him as a long-lost son? And for that matter, why do so many of the fairy tale characters have different stories that they want John to write for them instead of the ones in which they have lived for hundreds of years? John is not a mythical creature. He's only human, after all. But can he save the Mother Goose Carnival of Tales? Uh, sorry, here, I lost my place. Can he solve the mystery of the vanishing fairy tales? Okay. When a person buys a car or any other substantial object, it makes sense to walk around it and look at it from as many angles as possible. It makes sense that the many angled view is the best way to work towards what will eventually be a single idea. In the arts, these viewing angles are known as points of view. In the simpler art forms, those that serve for entertainment or to convey information, it's quite logical to maintain a single and consistent point of view. However, in the more complex art forms, those that respond to the complexity that human life here on the earth presents to us, artists such as writers in the field of the novel have developed techniques that provide a multiplicity of points of view. So the point of view that John takes in the passages that I will read in order to try to understand the experience that he's going through, I have labeled story, tower, points of view. Story hyphen tower, I'll talk about it later. There's one story tower in each of eight chapters and I will read them all. So each has three uh, lines really uh, and there's eight of them. So let's go to chapter two, page seven for the first one. Here we are. So they're little stories, okay? Little stories. It was an old clock that the owner had purchased at a flea market. As far as the clock knew, it was centuries ago. And then the third one, the time that the clock announced was ancient, but the owner was never to know. So that's three verses of one story tower. Okay, let's go to chapter three, page 14, and there'll be three more for this one. Duquaquius Duck lived in a dry pond on the side of a hill. The second one, if only I could invent a way for water to flow uphill, thought Duquaquius Duck. And then the third one, If I were a beaver, I would know a lot more about the properties of water, thought the quackliest duck. So, something to do with logic, eh? Duck logic, but also human logic, maybe. Let's go to page uh, 22. There we are for another one. This is uh, page 22, chapter 4. All things are true at all times, said uh, Heraclitus, or one of those other Greek philosophers in the Agora. Okay, and then, not all things are true at all times, said Heraclitus' brother, or, or perhaps a friend in the Agora. Some things are true at all times, and other things are not. And then we go to the third one. It is the task of everyone at all times to know which is which at any time, said either 
Heraclitus or another brother or another friend in the Agra that day. So plenty of human logic, plenty of human wisdom. Uh, chapter 5, we start at page 30 for another one. Vice Admiral L7C's Albatross was the Vice Admiral of the Albatross fleet. Okay, the second one I'm looking for, here it is. Vice Admiral L7C's Albatross's sailors liked him as a person for sure, but didn't have much confidence in the readiness of his warships to engage in combat should the necessity ever occur. And now we look for the third one. Vice Admiral L7C's albatross had banned all crossbows from the ships in his fleet and a small teakwood carving of a human dangled from a chain around his neck. So human logic, human confidence in others' logic. Chapter 6, uh, page 39 we start at. Okay, chapter 6, page 39. If one were born on the highest mountain, one could ski everywhere one goes, thought the avid skier. Okay, that's very logical. Let's go to the next one. If one were born in the deepest valley, one could climb everywhere one goes, thought the avid mountain climber. And the third one. If I could erode and fill the valley, that valley and I could be together until the end of time, thought the mountain. Okay, so everybody thinks... And we're looking at varieties of thinking, I would gather. Okay, chapter 7 then, page 48. Here's another one. There was a time in the early days of the world in which birds had no feet. No feet at all. The birds grew exhausted as they flew around and around in the sky. And then the third one. I have a theory, thought Batera Firma Bird, that if we just keep landing doggedly over and over again, despite the pain that we will accrue, we will grow feet in what will seem like no time at all. Okay, then we go to eight for another example of logic. The air on the surface of the earth is one part wisdom and three parts folly. The folly thins and, and disappears as the mountain is climbed. If one breathes at the top of a mountain, one will die. And then uh, the last one, chapter 9, page 64. Patera, <laughs> let me try this. Potentient pterodactyl. Okay, we're supposed to say pterodactyl. So, anyway, let me say this. Potentient pterodactyl was quite concerned. The sky was so dark that he couldn't venture to fly. Okay, and now we go on to this. All of the other pterodactyls seem to have disappeared. For all potential pterodactyl knew, he and his wives were the only pterodactyls left alive. And on to the last one. A thin shaft of sunlight broke through to the earth for the first time in, in months or, or perhaps it was years. Who wondered Ancient pterodactyl would be so callous, even so cruel, as to bring children into this inhospitable world. So there's some pterodactyl logic. Okay, so those are the uh, story towers in the book. They're spread out because they're interacting with one another, but they're also interacting with uh, 
all of the other imagery of the book, which is the imagery in the mind of the main character. Now, I have to admit that the term story tower, story hyphen tower, strikes me as a little bit clumsy. But when I thought of the term, I was at the point where I developed many different point of view techniques for the poetic novel, and I'd run out of the most clear and simple technical terms to use. It struck me that each example of this technical device was a story, and since there were three sections in each chapter, I visualized the three of them as stacked on one another. Hence the term story hyphen towers, story type towers. Luckily though, when I print my novels, I remove all the headings. So any clumsiness uh, in the nomenclature is not noticeable as a person reads the book. So you won't see the word story towers in the book if you read it. The reason that I developed the story tower technique is that I believe it's the desire of all thoughtful humans to consider a multiplicity of views as a means of attempting to understand the situation in which one finds itself. It's like walking around the car and looking at it from many angles. We do that with many things in our lives, right? We try to get a many angled view. So here we have John in a situation. He's walking up and down the midway of the Mother Goose Carnival of Tales escorted by Mother Goose and Jack of Jack and Jill fame. And he's watching the fairy tales which are being presented on the stages. After each performance, he's attempting to interview the fairy tale characters, but is finding that rather than answering questions, the fairy tale characters are launching into monologues in which they explain not their present situations, but the situations in which they'd rather find themselves. So what we have here as readers is three dashes. One, not only the eight little stories that I call the story towers, but number two, the seven preferred stories that are told by the fairy tale characters. And in addition, number three, the nursery rhyme stories in which these characters have been living for hundreds of years. So three sets of stories, three points of view. John's not a mythical creature. He's only a human after all. As a reader of this novella, John the Reader, I can only hope that the main character of this novella, John the Character, will be able to consider in the depths of his mind all of the implications of the interactions of all of these stories and come up with something logical as to the meaning of this particular experience. So I'm not sure how logical many of those characters in those little stories were, but hopefully we as readers and hopefully the main character are very logical when we try to puzzle out what's going on. However, as readers cannot help characters, John the character will have to puzzle out the meaning of this situation on his own. So, this is my novella, John and Mother Goose, The Carnival of Tales. It's available on Amazon if you want to look there for more information. It's available at my publisher's website, which is rocksmillspress.com. There's more information there. On my website, there are two free books. You just click on the cover icon, and there's the book on your screen for free. Uh, one is a planning notebook in which I planned and wrote the uh, novella. The other is a journal, a reflective journal, in which I just made notes on all kinds of topics as I polished the novella for a month or six weeks. So if you're interested in any of these topics, have a look. Uh, lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.